Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello, we are looking forward to talking to you today. This is a call-in show for you to call in about anything gardening that you might want to visit about. Maybe lawns or trees or fruit trees or shrubs or herbs or house plants. We're happy to talk about it all. So if you would get a pen and write down our number, it is 979-845-5689, 845-5689. Or by email garden success at tamu.edu. And we have our email working today. So that is a good thing. If we can if you have a plant you want to identify it or maybe you have a photo of it, that would sure be helpful. Uh, you can send it to the email. And I just remind you, when you send me photos of bugs or plants or anything, make sure that you attach them to the email. Use the little paper clip rather than inserting them or embedding them into the text of your email. It makes it easier for me to zoom in and out and see them kind of quickly uh, while I'm trying to also do the radio show at the same time. So uh, attach your attachments. Uh, don't, don't embed them. We had a couple of emails come in early, earlier on. This I guess came in some of them last week when our our system was on, my system was on the blink, uh, and they're about compost. So I want to go ahead and address those. One of them is uh, Brooks had asked about uh, composting animals, uh, and uh, you know can that be done? And uh, for you know from a home composting standpoint, if you're composting for your own use and things, I don't know what the rules are. I'm sure there are some kind of regulations on a commercial facility doing it, but um, from home composting, uh, yes, it can be done. Uh, the smaller the animal, the easier it is for it to break down, and you just definitely wouldn't want to be in there turning that compost pile. But whenever animals are, are down in uh, the pile, it's, it's a fairly... Um, um, simple thing for them to break down. It does take quite a while. Uh, and also, if you're in a neighborhood, you're going to have the potential for some odors, uh, for something digging around in the pile to get to get to that smell that is attracting them. And so just be aware of that. I wouldn't recommend it for a home backyard compost pile. Uh, but if you have a piece of property and you're doing some, some composting, that's, that's just fine. Uh, I won't go into details about it on the air, especially during the noon hour. Uh, but uh, if you'd like to to call, uh, you know, email me and talk off off the line. We can we can talk a little bit more about um, so how some of that is done. But anyway, uh, it can be done. And you just think about it. Everything that once was alive uh, it then passes away, and typically it decomposes on top of the ground. So uh, the idea of composting animals, although it may seem bizarre. Uh, that is certainly something that uh, is, is feasible, and nature will definitely take care of that. Uh, your neighbors will not be interested in you doing that, though. I can pretty much promise you that one. Another um, another question came in about or, uh, 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 from Tommy, and it was regarding uh, compost for the vegetable garden. We have a number of places here locally you can buy compost. Uh, you can buy compost from in bags from a number of garden centers. Uh, then there are bulk places that will sell you compost, such as the Twin Oaks Landfill uh, up north and just slightly uh, to the west in, in Bryan. Uh, and they they compost the uh, green wastes and screen it and provide a product. Uh, I, they also sell in bags, but uh, they typically people would get it bulk from them that uh, is a screen compost, just compost. Uh, then the, some of the soil yards um, and other places, I you know, hate to 
just mention brand names, company names and stuff, but there's some around town. You can find them with a search. Uh, they will often sell blends. And so with a blend, you're mixing uh, different things together to create a mix to grow things in. Now you could buy just straight, for example, Madisonville mushroom compost from some places. And that is some very potent stuff. In fact, it comes with a little bit of an odor. Uh, that odor breaks down uh, as the microbial activity uh, has air uh, and can, uh, you know, change from the anaerobic smells to some aerobic. And the, the um, I've used it before in my gardens in several places where I lived. It's very, very um, uh, nutrient rich for a compost even. And uh, that could be blended in with the soil you already have, as could any compost. Uh, with a with a mushroom, you may want to leach it out pretty good. That would just mean have some water run through it. Uh, any sodium that might be present uh, could could go be washed out that way. Now I realize we have sodium in our water as well, but uh, just kind of drenching it out and and with a, an excess amount of water, to that could help a little bit. I always wonder about adding something that already has sodium to a place where our water has sodium. So. Uh, then there's other ingredients that are mixed in, typically things called topsoil. Uh, they're almost not ever really topsoil, but they're, they're called that. Uh, they may be sandy uh, material that's been essentially mined out of the ground in, in sand pits where they dig it out. Uh, they could be um, soil scraped off the surface, uh, but topsoil is a very thin layer, very near the surface, and this we're talking about scraping a little bit deeper. Uh, I've I've bought some things before that were a mix of compost and uh, what was called topsoil, and basically I, I got kind of a compost mixed with a silty clay. It seemed like uh, maybe a sandy silt or something in between some of those, uh, and those are fine. It, it's just a it's it's hard to to give a name of a product and then go out and just purchase that when you're talking about organic matter in soil because it varies so much uh, based on even compost was a compost made with shredded tree limbs and branches uh, was it made using poultry waste also was it made you see what i'm saying there's there's a lot of different feed stocks that go into the compost and then there's different stages of the compost early in the process sometimes compost is sold before it's it's composted as far as i would like to see it composted uh, and then is it screened or not is it a very small particle size or are you getting some pretty woody chunks in there and there's a time when you may want uh, compost with a little bit of smaller woody chunks and so uh, the the bottom line is just go look at the product uh, you know kind of take a take a close look at it ask them what percentage of what is in it uh, and we would like to see some soil we would like to see some compost and both together in a bed mix uh, and then there's all kinds of different ways they blend it uh, you can uh, you can find uh, that even in an individual place, uh, what you buy one time and what you buy another time may have some variability to it, and that's just the nature of nature. Uh, so let's um, let's move on from compost for right now. Oh, but just to get back to Tommy's question, uh, those are those are fine to use in a vegetable garden. Uh, th those those would work just fine. Uh, just make sure that it's not if it if it has a a sour smell or a very foul odor. Uh, maybe give it a little more time uh, to cut, to air out and for the the good microbes to to take over and start doing their thing uh, before you would put it right into a veggie garden or just avoid it and go to another thing altogether. Let's go to the phones now and talk to John. Hey, John. Good morning. What's up? I, I have a, a cedar question. Uh, I've got a couple of cedar trees that are well, they're they're right in the. I, the lower part of the tree, uh, I need to trim out because it's, it's just it's blocking the view and everything else. Uh, is there a? a I, I've always heard you couldn't cut the top off a cedar tree because it would kill it. But can you take the lower limbs off? Yes. Uh, whenever you cut a cedar, or this would be true of a pine and true of a juniper of any kind, uh, when you cut them back past living scaly leaves or, or needles or whatever that particular evergreen has, that branch does not re-sprout and therefore it will die. Uh, and so if you cut lower limbs, it will not kill the tree. You just wouldn't get regrowth 
where you had cut it back like you would on most trees. You could also cut the top out of a cedar. Uh, if you leave lower living branches below that top, it would just have a very unusual shape as it grew into a tree. So, I mean, you may want to have an evergreen goal post in your yard, and that would be one way to achieve that, John. <laughs> no, I, I just want to, for two reasons, it, it's it's hard to work around that tree because their, their limbs are too low. Right. And also, it kind of blocks the view of, of the lake, and I'd like to just take it out. Yes. Bottom mm-hmm. limbs. Uh, is it time to fertilize fruit trees now? Or they're starting to bud out. I, we're getting flowers on some of our fruit trees. Yeah, you can. Uh, the trees aren't going to take up a lot of nutrient right now. Uh, I generally wait until spring, till they begin growth, to do it. And the only reason is... You know, we get the rains and and things, and you're going to have some of the nutrient potentially wash away, especially the nitrogen. Um, And so it might be a little more efficient to wait a little bit before you do that. Uh, But if you put it down and work it into the surface of the soil and water it in so that it's, uh, you've got it, you know, releasing those nutrients, uh, it's when the tree starts growing, they'll be there. Just remember that tree is, it's it's not like us. We, We eat about the same amount every day. That tree right now is not uh, taking up much nutrient at all, and when it really gets to its fastest growth, then there's a lot more water and nutrient flow as the weather heats up on moving into summer. So um, that's enough. First of April, then. I, I would I would wait until then. Yeah, any time in April would be good. There's nothing wrong with March. I mean it it it's not a black and white science on this one. It it just it's up to you. Sometimes other issues get in the way. You know, you got other jobs to do. You're going on vacation. You, I mean, do what you need to do. But if if it doesn't make any difference either way, I'd wait. With gas gas prices like they are, I'm not going on a vacation. <laughs> That's right. But, maybe you know, maybe you could just sit and watch the Travel Channel, and you know. <laughs> I I read something yesterday, and it really surprised me uh, that turnips are a biennial plant. Uh, can I, if I plant them now, what's going to happen? I mean, they'll, they'll still grow. They'll grow. They, but biennials are going to bolt and produce a bloom. And but if you get them to grow, that you'll still get a turnip on them. Uh, I just wouldn't delay too much because you want to have time to grow some good foliage so you can make a good sized turnip. You know, before it mm-hmm. would get too warm or before a thing would try to bolt. But let you know our, our our radishes are the same way. I had a bunch of radishes bolt last year because I left them and left them and never got around to eating them all. I we got a good crop of, of radishes going right now. They they're just jumping up. Yeah, we're good. Uh, Mary wants to know: Can she plant tomato seeds right now, or also can she put out her her transplants now? Well, according to the average weather, yes, uh, we're about to get really cold this weekend. So I'd let it, I'd get past that, let it warm up a little bit. Okay. Uh, and it's not just because it might freeze, but you know, you put that tomato that's been growing in really nice conditions out. And maybe it's seventy-five degrees during the day. Well, today I think is a good example. I believe we started at thirty-nine degrees and we're going up to seventy-four or something like that. Seventy-three. Uh, that's a huge temperature jump and they're not used to one of those nights that gets down maybe even just in the upper 40s with the wind blowing uh, so it, you might want to cover them if you get them out a little on the early side at the in the evenings just to kind of keep them from going through that shock i think you said you'd already put some transplants out yeah but i don't do what i say uh, i just ask <laughs> other people to <laughs> no i actually i i have i had put some out but they're in containers and so uh, I can move them in and things like that uh, but you you know you can hedge your bet I mean if, if you essentially build a greenhouse you can grow tomatoes all winter and we do that sometimes you see people put plastic in their garden down the row uh, mm-hmm. on PVC hoops and they essentially make a little mini greenhouse so if you cheat like that you can plant early uh, but is, is the ground warm enough for tomato seeds to germinate I do not know what our average soil temps are. I'm going to guess that we're in the upper 50s, maybe 60 or so. I'd, I'd have to check and see on soil temperature right now. Uh, they might sprout, but that would, uh, again, be a case where, you know, a, 
a Quonset hut of plastic down the row uh, would really warm it up under there. You would, In fact, you'd have to open the ends to keep it from getting too hot, and you could get a head start that way as well. I, I generally don't do tomatoes from seed, though, and here's why. It, it our varieties, we already are looking for fast days to harvest varieties, and that's because we're putting them out as transplants, trying to get fruit before it gets too hot. If right. you started, if you waited until you could plant seed, then you really are delaying that crop, and I, I think it would it would severely hamper your yields. Well, she's got a bunch of transplants. So I mean, a bunch of in the under the lights right now. So okay, you probably have enough just to plant those. Okay. Well. Okay. Uh, just have fun. That's the main thing. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> I appreciate your help. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the call, John. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to the phones now and talk to Kyle. Hello, Kyle. Hi. I'm in the car using Bluetooth. Is this going to work for it, the volume? It's going to work. Everything will work uh, just fine. Okay. Um, much from compost how does that compare with other types of compost it i found it to be pretty rich uh, lot, a lot of nutrient there um, but you know a compost is one word that describes a thousand different things uh, it just means something is decomposed and depending on what that something was uh, you know that and and at what stage of decomposition it's in the nutrient availability uh, can vary a lot, uh, and actually the nutrient content in general uh, that's in the material can vary some. So uh, mushroom is just fine. I, I use it. It, it just kind of comes in with a little odor usually. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going with that this year uh, primarily because I am convinced the things I add to my garden, mm -hmm. period, I mean, through the, annually or whatever, it's bringing seeds in, and I'm hoping the mushroom compost won't bring any seeds in. It should. It, the only way it could have seeds is if they piled it up in a place where there were seeds, some seeds on the ground, and when the bucket truck scoops it up, it gets a little bit of that, which is essentially no, don't worry about it. Um, the topsoils and things that are mixed in certainly can have seeds. But, you know, with mulch and things, I, I don't worry so much about the seeds because with mulch you, you can kind of keep it under control. Now, bringing in nuts edges, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> that's what I've got. Oh, nuts edge? You need to call a realtor and just move. That's the best way to get rid of it. <laughs> get you a new garden. Now there. Oh, Skip, you are so right. Yeah, there's... I've already asked you a question about the nut sedge, and you've given me some uh, recommendations. Right. But I do have an unrelated question. Okay. Uh, the annuals that I had planted in pots when they decayed or died, I just pulled them out. Mm -hmm. uh, so the soil, the potting soil, is still in there. Yes. Can I use reuse potting soil? The the general answer is yes. I, I do it every time. I have one pot the other day that I I bought and put some tomatoes in that the transplants came in. Uh, and they'd used a sandy mix in the trans in the in the uh, potting soil for the transplants, and they brought nematodes in. And at the end of the season, I could see nematodes on on the roots as I washed some of the soil back, and so that soil is getting that's gone. It's not going to go back into another container. Uh, if the plant died of certain root rot type diseases, you probably would want to just get rid of it and get you some fresh potting soil. But other than that, I reuse it all the time. I just mix some fresh in with it and it go, it's just fine. Potting soil is basically a real high percentage of composted organic matter and uh, it just breaks down and so you got to add to it. Do you buy the type that already has fertilizer in it? Uh, not a, not generally. You can do that, but I like to fertilize my way when I want to fertilize. And there's nothing wrong with those products that come with fertilizer. Some of them even have a slow-release product in there uh, that works really well, and it makes it a little bit foolproof uh, for people that just want to plant it and forget it. Uh, but I, I don't worry about whether it has fertilizer or not. You generally are paying a little bit to get that kind of potting soil. Right, And I, right. I just as soon watch my plants, and I know what they need and, and take care of them that way. But that's a preference. That's not a, a, a good or bad. 
Well, um, I'm an older gardener, and each year I say I am not going to fight this garden through the heat of the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. I guess I'm always looking for the miracle drug. Okay. This year I bought some humic acid. I have never used it. I don't know if it's uh, an old wives' tale or a waste of money. What do you think? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to know more about the product. You know, being sold as humic acid, um, there's. I, I need to know more about exactly what that really is. Uh, a lot of times things are bagged and sold as humus that are not humus. Humus is a very, almost a final uh, stage of decomposed organic matter. And it, uh, most of the time, if you buy what you, is being sold as humus, you're buying compost, or I say most. Yeah. A lot yeah. of times that's what I've seen. And, and so I, I would just, you know, go, it, it kind of depends on your goals. I, let me go back to what was making you want to give up the ghost in summer, though. And that's, that's, it's hot and the garden is hard to take care of. I, I use newspaper mulching in my beds during the spring, and that will carry you pretty far into the season. Uh, you you put four to six sheets of newspaper down, wet them with a garden hose, and you can cover a lot of ground pretty fast that way. You can plant through the paper, or you can put paper around when you already have some plants. It takes a little more time because you're having to kind of set paper up against the plant from three different sides or four different sides and then you throw an organic mulch on top it could be grass clippings or compost or shredded leaves you run over the lawnmower or anything and that pretty well takes care of most weed problems nuts edge will pop, pop through and bermuda grass will crawl around under the paper it won't poke through the paper but it'll look and look until it finds a hole uh, and, and then where there's a little sunlight and come through there but it's a it takes a huge amount of the work out of gardening. And you do that for weed suppression or holding moisture or why? Uh, well, it does. Like any mulch, it's going to hold some moisture, reduce the, the heating of the surface of the soil, and reduce the water loss from the surface of the soil. But it, I do it for weed suppression primarily because when it's June and it's blazing hot outside, I don't want to be out pulling weeds. Well, I've been pulling weeds for two full days. I've got some kind of weed this year I never had in 15 years. Okay. And the newspaper early in the spring sounds like a winner. Yeah, I've we've done it prior to planting. Uh, one year we were planting, what was it, uh, sweet potatoes. And, uh, you know, those you buy the little slips and you just stick them into moist soil and they root and grow. Uh, and so we newspapered the whole garden and filled the, the walkways with leaves so that you couldn't see dirt anywhere. And then uh, just pushed the, the slips right in, made hole in the newspaper with your trowel and pushed the slips right in. And had a nice patch with the vines going everywhere without having to try to get in between the vines and weed and do all the things you would have to do otherwise. Okay, I'm going to sign off and let some other folks in. Thanks All right. much. You just need to find a bunch of newspaper. <laughs> you Is know, it... and I I have a digital subscription, so I'll have to scrounge. Yeah, you, I, yes. Find find somebody who takes a paper or come up with other ways to get some newsprint. And good luck with that. Thank you for the call, Kyle. All right, let's uh, see. Our number is 845 Five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine, or by email at garden success at tamu. dot edu. Garden success at tamu. dot edu. Uh, I, what were we doing? We were talking about some emails that had come in and compost in the gardens and things. Uh, we had another email come in from Shelby uh, about uh, citrus. And specifically, a, a lemon tree, and uh, they had some scale insects on the lemon that really ravaged it. It looks like a lemon and an orange, uh, and had been and been hard on that on that tree. Well, the scale insects are hard on the trees. They generally, in and of themselves, don't just kill the tree, but uh, it can get bad enough to where the tree declines, it doesn't grow, and so on. Uh, you can control scale insects with uh, oil sprays. Uh, you want to use a horticultural oil, follow the label carefully. It's good to do it when it's not hot, uh, and if you co coat the, the scale with oil, 
they can't breathe and they die. And uh, during uh, the springtime of the year, and it's different with each scale as to exactly when, but the scale produces their babies. We, they call them crawlers. And so from that mama scale, here comes a bunch of, uh, it's like a hen and with little chicks running out from under her wings. Um, they, they find a new place to hunker down and develop that protective covering. Uh, it, but in that crawler stage, they're very susceptible uh, to control. And if you don't control them, then you end up going from, you know, one scale to many, many, many scale. And so uh, I would recommend the oil sprays. I think based on the fact that the description of the tree and the struggling, there may be more going on, such as uh, getting a little too dry at times because uh, it's in a container. Uh, and that can certainly set one back. Uh, th by the same token, soggy wet conditions are not good. If the hole that drains on the bottom of the pot is plugged and not draining well, or if there's not a hole, uh, then overwatering or maybe excessive rain and, and watering too could could be causing a problem. Uh, you're bringing it in for the cold weather, so I'll take cold out of the temperature. But if it does get exposed to some pretty chilly weather down in the 40s, uh, you're gonna you're gonna make it really unhappy with that as well. So what I'd recommend you doing is we're gonna get past this cold this weekend, and hopefully. That'll be the last of the freezing of the year. We'll see. Uh, but get you a soluble uh, fertilizer with plenty of nitrogen in it. And, and for a few waterings, water them with that at the lower label rate. Don't use the full label rate. Go to the lowest label rate, maybe like a quarter teaspoon in a gallon or something. Depends on the product. But very, very low. And water them with that, and I bet you, as as they get warmer weather and a, and that nutrient, I bet that you see a resumption in growth, and they start to look better. And then just keep taking care of them as you go through the year. You don't have to fertilize them every time you water them all year, but the first few times, let's see if we can get them perked up and going. You can also use a slow-release fertilizer. And there's several different kinds of products out there for that. That way you don't burn the plants with a very excessive amount of a synthetic salt-based type fertilizer, uh, but yet you kind of fertilize once and you got three months or more of, of feeding coming from that, that one application. I think you'll find that that works. Now, having said all that, um, when you have a really bad scale infestation, it's kind of like having a bad scale or mealybug infestation on your houseplants. There's always the question, do I ditch this plant and just get me a new one? That's the fast way to get out of the problem. Now, I realize that sometimes people are attached to the plants. They've had it for a long time, or maybe they got it from a relative who passed away. Uh, and I also know that it costs money to buy a new citrus plant. But there are times when that may be the simplest, easiest decision. Because if you want other citrus, too, it, and you bring them in and you've got these or house plants, and you've got these other insect problems that are right there nearby, uh, then the new plants just end up with the same problem. So that's kind of part of the decision, uh, Shelby, on, on your plant. I would, uh, I would just say uh, try the fertilizer, do the oil, uh, stay with it faithfully. Uh, you know, do it, check it out. Two weeks later, you might want to go ahead and do that again. Just avoid those oils and things when it's, uh, you know, in the 90 degrees outside uh, uh, temperatures. But in general, I think you can get ahead of it. Um, there are also lady beetles that will come and eat uh, certain kinds of scales that we have. And so once it's outside and the lady beetles figure out it's there, you may have one or more species of lady beetles, and, and there are many, uh, that, that show up and help with uh, the problem. They, they are not going to eradicate every scale you have, but they certainly will help with that scale population explosion. Our phone number is 845 5689 or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, talking about, let's talk about a few things around and about town. Friday, March 11th, which is tomorrow, the A&M Garden Club is meeting at 1030. Uh, at uh, Peace Lutheran Church, which is 2101 Rio Grande in uh, College Station. I used to say South College Station because that was 
far South College Station when I was in school, uh, but now it's it's probably not called South College Station anymore. Uh, but anyway, the, at 10.30 in the morning, there'll be a presentation on a cheer bouquet workshop. So that's a small container arrangement for elderly in a care facility. After you get through, or the group gets through making these cheer bouquets and learning how to do that, they'll distribute those to a facility uh, after the club as a service project. And that's Peace Lutheran Church, 10.30 a.m., the A&M Garden Club, tomorrow, Friday the 11th. Let's go to the phones now and talk to Dan. Hello, Dan. Hi, Skip. Uh, I have a question about pruning new stone fruit, bare root trees that were planted in the fall. Okay. Um, so watching YouTube videos and reading literature, it says be pretty aggressive. Yes. And, you know, cut them knee high, mm -hmm. even though when they arrived at my house, they were six, eight foot tall. Right. Um, is is I, that what I should be doing? Uh, yes, but I'm going to clarify that a little bit. Um, so you'll see a lot of different kinds of advice out there. Um, some of it accurate, some of it not as accurate or inaccurate. Um, you said stone fruit, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it just, yeah, for people that are listening, stone fruit are the fruit with a pit. So an apricot, a plum, a peach, those are all stone fruit as opposed to apples and pears, which are palm fruit. Uh, so the stone fruits, I would not cut them to knee high. I would cut them to about pocket high. And th there's two ways to go about this. Um, the lower you cut them, of course, the lower your scaffold branches are going to be when they form. Uh, and if you go knee high, those branches are really down low in the soil or at the soil. And, and as they sag down, they're going to be in the dirt. And so I would come up a little bit higher than that and uh, maybe pocket high and cut them off there. If you go higher, it just means the start of your scaffold is higher in the tree. And so when you get to the first peaches or plums, you're already picking at shoulder or head high. And so I would rather lower the production without getting it down in the dirt, if that makes sense. So if you cut them off about pocket high, and as they re-sprout, you're going to end up selecting three or four, I would say three is best, branches that are going in opposite directions. Three opposite directions. So if, imagine a triangle as you're looking down on the top of the, from the above, the, the trunk. Uh, you'd like branches going out in three different directions. And then they'll go out and they'll they'll split and branch. They'll have side shoots. And you'll just continue to train it in that open bowl shape. The A&M Horticulture website, it's aggiehorticulture.aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu, uh, has a publication on peaches and plums. And it shows you how to prune in there. Uh, they sometimes, I think in that one, they may start them a little lower than I, I generally do. But I don't. I need to see it when I'm talking to to be sure about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, when you start a tree that way, you just keep the branches that are part of the bowl. So imagine when you look at it, this giant bowl that it will be in four or five years. Uh, and so if a branch is going backwards down toward the ground, that's not part of the bowl. It gets cut off. If it's going into the center of the bowl, that's not part of the bowl. It gets cut off. And that's as much as I can kind of simplify it as I wave my hands in the air, which no one on the radio can see, right? <laughs> yeah. trying, to, trying to picture it. Someone put it pretty good to me one time. It says, imagine if you hold your arm up vertical and you put your fingers out like you're holding a softball and then take the softball out of your hand, how your fingers are, that's kind of what your peach tree branches are going to eventually end up being like. I don't know if that helps oh. or not. but <laughs> It does, yeah. Thank you. And um, should I continue pruning in the summertime to sort of... Yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah. yeah so so anything, that's, mm -hmm. anything that's crowding or going the wrong way. Right. And, and we're not talking about, you know, giant loppers. We're not talking about saws and all that. We're just talking about just snipping off branches saying, you know, this is a nice little branch, but it, it doesn't have a future in this tree because, you know, and it's too crowded with another branch or it's going, as I said, into or out of the bowl. Uh, and, and so you remove them. Uh, th it's especially important as we get... Uh, toward midsummer and late summer, uh, because you're going to have some really vigorous branches, and this will happen more in years two and three, but uh, that try to become water sprouts 
and they grow straight up with lots of vigor in the middle of the tree and they shade out your interior. So when you create a nice bowl, you're going to have peaches all the way from almost where the scaffolds leave the trunk all the way out on the branches. And so with those suckers or, or, or water sprouts, in the case if they're coming off branches, uh, they shade that out. So you can look at the color of the peach branch. Uh, when a new shoot comes out, it's kind of greenish. And then as we get toward the end of the year, you see kind of a, a reddish, a maroonish color, a, bur a burgundy color to it. And that's a good fruiting branch. When they start to get vigorous and they're the size of your fingers or bigger, and they're kind of a blondish tan color, that's a water sprout. And you want to take those out because later in the summer and the fall is when the fruit sets for next year. And if you've, if it's, it's been shaded and it doesn't, isn't able to set fruit, well, you won't have any fruit in that area. So don't let the water sprouts uh, become vigorous and get away from you. And I know how it is with summer. You get busy with other things, and next thing you know, you're, oh, my goodness, i got to get out there and do something about these trees. And I think I've heard you say on prior shows that um, we should remove any fruit in the first few years to focus on the structure. Uh, that would be better. For, the, for a peach tree, I would say the first two years. The third okay. year, if you've watered and fertilized it and it's making a nice sized tree, you could have some fruit on it. That's fine. Uh, but, but it, you know, a th your three year old peach tree and your neighbor's three year old peach tree could be 300% different in size, right? Yep. So it, it's kind of hard to go by number of years, but a, a good healthy tree growing right for three years ought to be able to bear fruit. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good luck with that. All right. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689. And uh, you can also email me at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Let's go back to what's happening around town. On Monday, March 14th, this coming Monday, the Brazos Valley Orchard Orchid Society is meeting at 7 p.m. And this is a, a very interesting meeting. By the way, it's at Fire Station Number 6 on the corner of Tarot and University in College Station. Fire Station Number 6 in College Station, 7 p.m. In this meeting, you can bring your orchids, and they will discuss with you how to repot them. And I was visiting with someone just yesterday who had some orchids that were getting kind of uh, lanky. The You know how the, the little roots are coming out and... and uh, it, they're coming out higher and higher on the plant, and it looks like you need to cut off the bottom and repot it. Well, don't do that just yet. Take your orchids to the Orchid Society meeting and let them tell you how to properly repot your orchid. Because orchids are they're viewed as dainty flowers that are very hard to grow. And some of them are difficult to grow uh, because they have certain temperature requirements that just don't typically happen around here. Uh, and they can be a challenge. But the one you see everywhere, the moth orchid, the phalaenopsis orchid, those are those are easy to grow. They're, they really are easy to grow if you just follow a few principles. And the folks at the Orchid Society can help you know what it takes uh, to do that. And I have some. I have three left over. And I can tell you this, uh, although I, I hate to admit it on the air, they get neglected a lot. And yet with just a moderate amount of care, uh, I've got three blooming orchids from some past year when I bought one. And uh, it, I see a lot of people that, that uh, have success with that. So uh, Monday, March 14th, 7 p.m., Fire Station Number 6, uh, Orchid Society, the Brazos Valley Orchid Society. Bring them your orchids to take a look at and find out what do I do with this, and they can help you. On Tuesday, March 22nd, the Ta Texas A&M Garden Interest Group, Women's Garden Interest Group. They call it the GIG, G-I-G, uh, 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. And Charla Anthony uh, is going to be talking about Made in the Shade, Plants That Don't Sunbathe. And she'll talk about common and not-so-common plants for shady sites in our landscape. And we have a lot of uh, live oak trees around here, and those are always a challenge uh, because they cast such a deep shade. And then we have other species that may be deciduous of, of trees that create a beautiful uh, 
shady area in the landscape where it's tolerable to get outside during our hot summer weather. Uh, but what about the plants for those areas? Well, Charla, Charla was at the AgriLife Extension Office, actually in the position I'm in, uh, for years and years. And she is a very accomplished professional horticulturist that, that knows what she's talking about. And she's going to going to give you some ideas on plants that will tolerate or even enjoy a shady area. Now, the Garden Interest Group uh, meets at Peace Lutheran Church uh, at 2101, just like the other meeting I was talking about, Rio Grande Boulevard, and that will be from 1130 to 130. Uh, and I next Tuesday, March or not next Tuesday, excuse me, March 22nd. I'm announcing that one a little ahead of time, but uh, I think you really need to get that one on your on your calendar because we have so many shady areas that can be rehabilitated in our landscapes and turn into a beautiful a beautiful area. Uh, Tuesday, March 15th, the uh, Antique Rose Emporium is going to have a, a, a event called Petals in the Pathways, a great photo op. So you know how we like to bring our kids out for the blue bonnets and things? Well, this is a little early for big blue bonnet season, but uh, Tuesday, March 15th through Thursday, March 17th. So this isn't just a one day. It's it's March 15th, 16th, and 17th. Uh, out at the Antique Rose Emporium uh, on FM 50, uh, heading uh, toward Brenham, uh, Texas. For more information, you can go to their website, uh, and they can uh, provide that for you. Uh, the other upcoming events, the uh, Brazos County Master Gardeners having their spring plant sale on, uh, let's see, on March 26th. That's a Saturday, and it's at the new Extension Office, which is next to the Brazos County Tax Office. Now, this begins, and this is early for, for a sale, it begins at 8 a.m. and goes till 11 a.m. And this will be the day of the big event. So uh, you can get in there and get your shopping done early and then get back home for if you've if you're participating in the big event. Uh, Master Gardeners are going to have natives, perennials, shrubs, herbs, vegetables, uh, all kinds of things suited to our growing conditions right here. And they raise funds and put those funds to work in our educational program. So that's a, a good cause as well. Uh, there are a lot of other plant sales coming up, and I'll be talking about those as, as we get closer uh, to them also. Uh, let's see. We've got, let me give you a phone number again. It's 845-5689. Uh, give us a call at 845-5689. Or you can email me at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Gardensuccess at T-A-M-U Dot edu. And as I was saying that, uh, we had an email come in uh, from Jennifer, and uh, Jennifer has some things going on in the St. Augustine, and what was a small spot has grown larger, and uh, when looking into it, it, it just kind of bare soil. Uh, and th these are always kind of challenging because there are different things that, that, that can cause a lawn to decline, but one of the things that just in general seems to cause a decline is a disease called take all root rot and i would suspect if this was if you evaluated this that is probably what you would find uh, is take all root rot take all kills the roots as its name would infer and as a result the plant declines and you often will see them looking okay in the spring when there aren't so many demands and the plant has a few roots the grass plant uh, saint augustine grass in this case uh, has a few roots to be able to get to keep going and then as the demands go up the plant really collapses but a lot of the infection is occurring in the fall and in the spring season of the year if there's a uh, compacted soil from foot traffic from people or animals uh, then that is going to be more the case if it's a low spot where water water tends to gather and it stays a little soggy or wet especially in our clay soils that we have in much of the area that could add to it so there's different there's different stresses that seem to predispose the problem, the plant to this infection. Um, I would recommend taking a sample, and this is for the others of you who this year are having problems in your lawn. Uh, you can you can email us, and I can send you information, a little video on how to take a lawn sample. You want a sample of sick grass, but not dead grass. Uh, and I always say to help people remember that is we do diagnoses, not autopsies. So bring me sick grass and uh, about four by four, four by six inch plug in a Ziploc or other zip closure type bag, 
uh, with name, address, email, phone number, so we can contact you in various ways or email you a publication if that is appropriate uh, for the problem. Uh, and we'll be happy to take a look at it at the office. Now, there's also the plant clinic here on campus. They uh, they do uh, plant samples as well. And uh, but we I, th I think we can take a first shot at it at least. And most of the time, especially with take all, I can identify that and and get you on the on track to getting things healthy again. It may involve uh, aeration. It it may involve a use of a fungicide. Uh, and in a case of really severe loss, it will involve replugging grass into that area. Uh, once you've once you've got a bare spot that's about mm, 18 inches or bigger, uh, the, the grass is just not going to crawl in fast enough to close over uh, that area in any short time, and so that would also be involved. So thanks for that uh, question, Jennifer. Uh, let's see, we want to go back to the phones again, the number 845-5689, and talk to John. Hey, John. I forgot to ask something Mary wanted to know. She okay. read in an article that, that, cu that cucumbers are a natural pest re repellent, and that even recommended taking slices of cucumbers and, and put them in your bed. Is there any truth to that, or is that just a wives' tale or what? I've never heard that. And I don't believe it. Um, I I don't know what else to say. Um, I know I know that cucumbers have pest problems, <laughs> so I, I would I would say I don't think that's true. Uh, but you know, on that I would have to go out and look and and see. I just you hear a lot of these things, and oh my gosh, it's um, uh, Pinterest is. I, and I, I, I doubt Mary's out uh, surfing Pinterest, but a lot of the social media like Pinterest and places like that, they put they put stuff up that's just not true. I mean, it's interesting. It's, you know, uh, used to be a guy, I won't use his name, but he was on the radio, not all, not just here, but I mean all over America. Uh, and he would talk about using beer on your lawn. And, uh, you know, if you put beer on your lawn, it does this or that. Well, I got better uses for beer, number one. Uh, number two, the, there's just not a lot of science behind some of those kinds of things. And so, but, you know, people love that kind of stuff because it's, it's so interesting, you know, to think about. Uh, so I think the cucumber probably falls into that category. I work too hard for my cucumbers to be cutting them up and throwing them in the garden. Well, I work, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that It'd be nice if that worked, though. Maybe. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'll, let, I'll let somebody else try yeah, that. I think so. I think so. Uh, wow, that is that is interesting. You know, I bet, and, and I, I would have to chase this down. I don't know if I'll remember to do it later, but uh, a lot of times these things are based on a truth. You know, they start with a truth, and then the truth gets taken to a point where now it's not even close to being true or working. Uh, so there maybe there's, I, I know cucurbits have some compounds in them that can be uh, uh, damaging to insects, uh, but I don't think a sliced cucumber that would be something you'd be willing to eat would have, have that in it. Okay, I, th this was actually in a in a in appeared in in simply green. Uh, okay. So I don't know. We'll uh, we'll leave the jury out. Well, if you try it, uh, report back. I'd be curious to see how it does. <laughs> okay, Skip. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's go back to the phones now and talk to Randy. Hey, Randy. How to Skip? How are you? I'm well. What's up? I wanted to ask you. Is uh, you know we got a. This weekend, maybe, you know, another freeze. But after that, do you think that's a good time to start potting, you know, repotting plants that I want to repot? Mm -hmm. you know, for example, I got three bougainvillea that I want to do. I do. And I remember you said to wait to do them until it, you're going to put them outside because yes. um, maybe getting close to that. So yeah. after this weekend, you think that would be a good time to do it? I think so. You know, the days are going to be nice as we get in, in toward the uh, end of March, especially. Uh, in terms of temperature, uh, but we're going to have some chilly nights, so, you know, you might just, you've got them under protection right now. You may have to kind of keep them there, but you can go ahead and get them potted and get them started. Uh, okay. So, yeah. You have a lot of bougainvilleas? Uh, yeah, well, i got three that are hangers and then, like, uh, two more that are gigantic and they're in big pots, but oh, I haven't yeah. put anything outside because I just know that uh, yeah. you can't trust uh 
You know, March, what do they say? Comes in like a lion and leaves like a lamb. That's true. That's true. Don't know anything about it right now. But, I mean, um, what is um, what is too cold for uh, those, in your opinion? Well, it's a it's a sliding scale. There's freezing and killing them, and then there's too cold and making them unhappy, you know, and then there's a little chilly. They're not happy. They're not going to grow, but they're sitting there. And so I don't know where along that scale you're wanting to take the plants, but uh, sometimes with greenhouse space at a limit, <laughs> certain plants, right. you know, don't get quite as much protection. Maybe they get stuck in a garage uh, right. the, near a window if there is one. Uh, but... Um, I, I would that's kind of what they do now. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put them out in the 40s and maybe even lower 50s. I don't think they'll be very happy. They're just not going to kill them, but they're just not going to like it. Okay, that's what I want to know. All right. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Our number is eight four five five six eight nine. And let's uh, talk now to Susan. Hello, Susan. Hello, Skip. I um. I've got a question, and I'll try to not make it complicated, which I can do often, <laughs> but I was uh, taking your advice from last year and testing out some soil issues that I had that actually killed my tomato plants um, due to my husband being a farmer and just, you know, our livelihood and just things that happen around us. So I have sprouted some green beans that I want to plant. Okay. But this freeze has really thrown me off. And I wasn't for sure if the seeds were good seeds, so I kind of wanted to sprout them to make sure they were good. Mm -hmm. And um, just let them germinate just a little bit on a paper towel. How do you recommend I plant those? Should I go out and get some of that soil, bring them in, and try to grow them in a pot in some soil under a light, or should I just make a trench and plant those green beans like I didn't sprout them? Okay, so you're not you're you're not talking about sprouting the ones on the paper towel. You're talking about planting green beans, just dry seed in the garden. Or yeah, I've already sprouted. Well, I have some that I haven't sprouted, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just um, I'm not a hundred percent sure that that soil mm -hmm. is free of all the. Um, are you, are you thinking things about diseases? that were in there? The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, there was some um, cotton burrs that were put in there, and they probably had some, you know, chemicals that were put on the cotton to kill the cotton. But okay. I didn't. Okay. You know, well, green, realize. green beans so would be kind of testing my soil. Yeah, green beans would be a good way to find out because uh, the seed, right. you know, you're not spending that much money on the seed, and they're going to be sensitive to some of the kinds mm. of products that might be there. Now, it it just depends on which chemical we're we're looking for, uh, you know, or concerned about. Uh, but I would say, I, I I would say probably. As far as green beans, I would want to get about maybe another couple of weeks before I put the seed out. And I know there are people out there that are planting them a little earlier than that, but they do like kind of warmer soil. Uh, so if, if we could predict the weather and if we knew that after this weekend it was going to go up into the 70s and pretty much stay there, well, then then they probably could go on out and, and do just fine. Uh, as far as pre-sprouting them, yeah, people do that with seeds sometimes. They, they soak them overnight just to get the seeds started or get the little root coming out even. That would be more than overnight. You would have to change the water out on it. Um, keep them moist and pre-sprout them. And that way you can see exactly which ones are sprouting and which ones are not. And so if you've got a whole lot of seed and you don't know which ones are good, that would be a way to get a much better stand out there but it's not necessary beans are they're willing to sprout they're just not going to be willing to sprout in cold soil okay yeah so if i'm in, I, i'm kind of anxious because i like to get my tomatoes out pretty early and okay put the protection around them of course but my main concern is 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 that soil going to be okay for this garden season or not mm -hmm. um so do, do you remember the best bet is to go get some bring it in 
and grow those. Exactly. Uh, keep sprouting. Okay. That is exactly what okay. you should do. Go take samples from different places in that yard. Put it in anything, a little styrofoam coffee cup, it doesn't matter, and grow up, grow a little bean seed. And if there's a problem, you're going to know it. You know, after that thing comes up, uh, you know, you grow it for a couple of weeks even, watching how it's growing, making sure it has plenty of light. Uh, and, and that is the way to, to test. I can't recall what the chemical was that caused the problem in your I soil. Don't, but, I don't have them. All. My husband's a cotton farmer mm -hmm. and... You know, so yeah. we got it from the gin. Like, we take our cotton to have it processed. Mm -hmm. And so I got cotton burrs from the gin. Okay. Well, it could have been any cotton farmer around. So there's no way right. that I could truly know exactly what was put on there. Okay, but, I get you. I get you. Well, um, yeah, I that's I let's do the little test. That's the simplest thing. I mean, I could contact some of our agronomy folks and and ask them what kind of stuff are we probably dealing with. That's not a world that I I live and work in. So uh, all the chemistries right. that are being used there are not familiar well, to me. Well, what is done is done. I am looking for some alternative places to make a garden as well, just to have options so that this doesn't happen again. Yes. But um, in yeah. 30 years ago, when my dad used uh, cotton burrs, they didn't use that on the cotton, and it was a great composting That's thing to use. That's right. It was very good. So, I remember people just spreading it on their lawns and how green that lawn yes. would be coming through. So different times, and it, it was a lesson I learned. Well, and it may but, still be okay. I, j I don't want to... You know, right. I don't want to infer that there's bad stuff in cotton burr compost. It, it, that may not be the case. Uh, so right. we'll just we'll just right. wait. It, it might be fine this year, but when you work too hard for those tomato plants to just get them out there and watch them die. So well, I'm going to – That's a, that was a good plan to get the soil and bring it in. Yeah, grow. That, that's always a good way because sometimes people get uh, manure in from um, – you know, animals that have been grazing on pastures that have been right. treated with certain brush control. And uh, that's another way to test that. It's, and I would not plant a seed in straight manure, but you get the idea. You you just right. you just test it, and you'll know pretty quick. Because some of those things are pretty persistent. Uh, and, and you want to have that, um, you know, confidence before you go out. Uh, you want to be relieved if it's not going to be out there. In the So my seeds that I have sprouted are getting, I mean, they've, probably on day five now so they're getting pretty big there okay do you think there's a shock factor that they go from no soil to soil not from no um, soil to soil but the older the seed gets the the more of a, a jolt it is but pre-sprouting is just fine if you want to do that okay all, All right. right. Well, thank you for your answer. Yeah, and thank you. I was glad the way the call went. You know, when someone starts a call off by saying, well, I did what you told me last year, I'm always <laughs> worried that the second half is going to be, you, and my whole lawn died, and I'm holding you responsible. But it didn't turn out yeah. that way. Yeah. Well, you. you know, gardening is nothing but an experiment. We're all just having fun doing it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you very much for the call, Susan. Right. Well, Thanks. we've We've come to the end of the show here, and we're going to look forward to talking to you guys again next Thursday. Uh, if you got gardening questions in the meantime, feel free to call the AgriLife Extension Office or go online to aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu and download some of that free information to help you with your garden. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.